Hello there, and welcome to Speaking of Our Words, programming that brings you the wide range of voices and stories and forms of local writers and offering you some insight into their creative process. My name is Chris DeGuire. I teach creative writing workshops at Columbia College Chicago, and I am your host. We have several open mic guests today, but uh, we will be featuring author, Chicago author Brian Costello. Brian Costello is the author of The Enchanters vs. Sprawlberg Springs, a very funny book. He is a musician, a comedian, and a talk show host. He teaches creative writing classes at Columbia College Chicago. He's been a friend and colleague of mine for many years. And his latest novel, Losing in Gainesville, which is also very funny, is out now. He lives in Chicago, but I believe right now he is returning from a book tour in Boston. Is that right, Brian? Uh, yeah, I went east. Uh, Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Brooklyn, Boston. Now I'm driving back. I'm at the one of the Ohio Turnpike food courts. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on the old Ohio Turnpike food courts. Is that, is, is that the Popeyes or the Burger King one that you're at? Uh, this is the uh, Hardee's. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, what, so what's it like being on tour for a book? Like, like you know, out of all the cities, like where do you actually go to do these readings or questionnaires, and where do you end up staying? That sort of stuff. Oh, uh, you know, it's uh, a lot easier in a lot of ways than doing a band tour. You know, just because it's like you know, I play drums and shit. Mm -hmm. You get done reading, you just close the book, and you're done. Um, as opposed to you know, breaking down all the drums and then waiting until 2 in the morning to get paid and all that mm -hmm. stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, and they start earlier. They start at 7, usually done by 8. Mm -hmm. uh, read at a lot of like community activist to anarchist bookstores on this tour for some reason. I'm not sure how that happened. Mm -hmm. But everybody was really great <laughs> and uh, really nice. Uh, met a lot of wonderful people along the way. Oh, good, good. It, it still sounds kind of rock and roll to be out there touring for, touring for a book like that. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite memories is being on your old talk show, The Brian Costello Show with Brian Costello, uh, about six or seven years ago at the Empty Bottle. You remember that? It was after the, oh, um, sure. after the Bears lost the Super Bowl there to the Colts, and you wanted me to play, what was it, the <laughs> crusty Wisconsinite or something like that? Uh, no, you, uh, unrepentant. The yeah. Unrepentant, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, and you had me come in wearing my Peyton Manning jersey, and you told me it was rude to do, be doing that, and the crowd was booing me, so I took it off, and uh, underneath there you, you told me to have my Brett Favre jersey on, which I did, and got a lot more booze for that. So that was that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Are, are, are you still hosting? Fun. Are you still hosting talk shows? Are you hosting that one in particular? Are you still doing that sort of stuff too? Uh, not that one so much. Uh, I do a monthly show. Uh, at the hideout in Chicago called Shame That Tune. I co-host it with uh, oh, yeah. friend Abraham Levitan. Yeah. It's more of a tighter ship, but it's like more uh, like there's a wheel with different songs and contestant spins the wheel, it lands on, say, I don't know, Stairway to Heaven. Okay, then they tell a shameful story from high school, something embarrassing, silly. Then I interview them, and while that's happening, Abraham is a very gifted piano player. He's making mm -hmm. up a song, a, a He's making up in the style of "Say Sorry to Heaven" a song about that story. So then, when that the interview's done, he plays the song. That sounds like a lot of fun. Hilarity ensues. Yes, hilarity ensues. <laughs> I've I've always wanted to go check that out, and I'm going to have to I'm going to have to definitely sometime. Well, just to let you know, Brian, I am wearing my my Brett Favre jersey again, but it is not an homage <laughs> to the old show that we did. It is it is more because of the game that's coming up on Sunday. So so tell us a little bit yeah, about this right, book. Right. Tell us a little bit about this book, Brian. Losing in Gainesville. What's it What's it all about? Well, its uh, title says it all, I think, in a lot of ways, but it's set in the middle uh, 1990s in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, sort of a novel in stories. It follows about 40 different characters around. There's one main character who's moved there to uh, try to find a place to live where he can write and play music. And everyone's losing in different ways, different definitions of that word. Uh, while it's mainly people in their 20s, there's older people, uh, 30s, 60s. There's also a couple teenagers in there, I think. But everybody's losing and trying to make sense of that, especially uh, I mean, the main focus, I think, post-college, when people are just tend to flounder for a couple of years at least, mm -hmm. you know, they're trying to figure out what, what's next. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your point of view choices in a moment, but your 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 previous book, The Enchanters versus Sprawlberg Springs, was also, uh, I believe, set in Florida. Are you, are you from Florida? Do I not know this about you? Uh, yeah, I'm from there. I 
Yeah, I, I grew up there. I went to high school and college there. I grew up in Peoria before that. Mm-hmm. When, when, yeah. And then why, because I know you've been in Chicago now for many years, what's, what, is, what is fun or what is interesting about setting these, these major pieces of yours in Florida, these places where you're from? Well, it's, uh, I think it's kind of one of those states that people want or even has an opinion about. And, you know, there's kind of enigmatic to some people or they just went to Disney World and it's still like what's going on down there. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people just don't seem to know or have opinions on it that don't really understand. And, mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, it's obviously a very interesting place. There's really, now I've I think I've been everywhere in the lower 48 mm-hmm. in America. Uh, there's really no place like it. I say you've, you've got these. Wonderful. Yeah, you you've got these characters that are going through, you know, these sort of life changes that you know characters almost anywhere could be going to. So how how important then is place, or how does place affect, you know, the stories you're trying to tell? Uh. How, how does place affect it? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the whole, uh, I think with both books, the place was a character into itself, you know. I was trying to create that world, and, uh, and it was a college, the, the Gainesville, losing Gainesville, it's, you know, set in a college town, mm-hmm. and that definitely has an impact on everything. Um, Gainesville is kind of this uh, blue oasis and you know, a sea of red, mm-hmm. so, you know, I think a lot of places in the South that have that, like Austin, Texas, stands out immediately as an example of that, where it's going to be kind of a magnet for all the weirdos. That, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> and then with Florida, you get like all the weirdos from all over the country that go down there in the wintertime, just to, they're traveling or whatever, you know, they'll mm-hmm. live in, around Gainesville as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this this book it, it it more or less follows the point of view of uh, Ronnie Altamont, and and it's mostly in third person. But you you talk about how it does, f- you know, follow the points of view of a lot of other characters as well. There, there are some chapters following other characters, and I think some even in Ronnie's point of view, they're even in first person, and 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 even your third person uh, voice, Brian, just sounds very first person, like like the sort of. Uh, community voice. So how did you, or why did you end up settling on on following these various points of views like this and and doing these sort of changes, especially since, you know, we're we're always told to stick to one point of view and then you go ahead and break this rule and follow all these different characters in, in different ways. Oh, that was, uh, you know, a lot of things really. I think uh, one of the things I think we're taught at Columbia is to go for the most dramatic point of view to take and that was a part of it with each section you know if i the next book won't be multiple points of view (laughs) it's such a slog but uh yeah you know uh, some of it was also um i'd never really done much writing in third person and i just gotten really sick of first person and a lot of the subject matter that is covered in the book is so often written in first person by some big voice yelling guy and i didn't really want that i wanted something a little more like pulled back with, you know, uh, access, permission to do whatever I wanted, really, that would work with each mm-hmm. chapter and with each character. And, you know, I was also just, yeah, I, I think at the time I was just really bored with first person. There's just a lot of people doing it, and a lot of people just over yeah. yelling for the sake of yelling and cursing for the sake of cursing. Yeah, it seemed like for a while that... It got played out. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I know when I was working, you know, most of the stuff that I was doing in, in Columbia too as a student, a lot of it was in was in first person, and I think it came from teaching the the nose in fiction too for about two hundred semesters in a row, and I really got, I really got taken by uh, that sort of community voice. I know that's what I've been doing a lot with my writing uh, in third person. I don't know if you, I don't know if you've read Eric May's book yet, but he does the same yeah, thing. He's following all these various points of view. Um, I know music plays a huge role in your stories. I mean, you yourself play the drums, and you've you've toured and everything like that. And you're with your characters being, you know, around college age and trying to figure out what life is up, what life is all about. They listen to a lot of a lot of music, a lot of punk rock. Like, you drop a lot of band names in your books, especially this one, like the Ramones and the Minutemen and uh, the Dead Milkmen, and even like you know the Who and Van Halen and. Uh, and you even give a shout out and some some lyrics from Billy Squire, which I thought was pretty awesome. 
Um, <laughs> not everyone, not everyone knows these bands, you know, or let alone even have an, an interest in music. So, how do you think about audience when you're writing, and how does this this audience awareness affect how you decide what you're gonna what you're gonna do in your stories as far as pop culture references, especially especially music in your work? Um, it's kind of inescapable for me. Mm -hmm. I, I just I think it's like I hopefully people can enjoy it without having to own all those albums, you know, it's, uh, and I've read plenty of books that make allusions to other books and references to other writers that I'm not overly familiar with, but it doesn't hinder my enjoyment of the book. So I hope that, you know, for the people that do know what I'm talking about, you know, that makes it that much more enjoyable, but I don't think it, you know, hopefully it doesn't make people turn people off to the, to the book at all, you know, because that was never, it wasn't like trying to be elitist, and it just kind of came in naturally. Oh, sure, <laughs> sure. Right. Yeah, because I know that, I don't remember uh, uh, Drew Ferguson from, from back in the day, and I know he was a huge David Bowie fan, and everything he wrote, there was always some sort of a David Bowie reference in there, <laughs> and I, I know in one of these books that I'm working on that I've read excerpts from on this show with my writer's group, you know, it's these guys in this Judas Priest cover band, so it's all these all these metal bands, but then just always, you know, wondering about the, the audience that is not into it. And again, I've always just tried to make sure that, you know, they're into the story. These are things that, you know, lots of people go through as, as well. This is just the background that these characters uh, are in. And I know I found some success uh, doing that as well. You know, yeah, and if it plants a seed also, of like, hey, what's this band like? Maybe I should go listen to it. That's, that's great too. I mean, I think of a, uh, I think my friends and I probably first heard the Ramones. Well, I'd heard the Ramones before that, but I had friends that had discovered them through reading Pet Cemetery. Because <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, I think that's, hey, how let's go, the like, uh, epic photograph or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like the first quote at the beginning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So what what kind of research did you end up having to do for this, for this book? Well, uh, the first draft was based on, I mean, I went back and found journals from that time. So that was a lot of research there was uh, going through all the, I kept, they kept a lot of journals then. I mm -hmm. know, just wrote so much no matter what was happening. And that was the starting point before I really knew what the book was about. And then, and that, and then that first draft was first person and then it devolved from there, you know, but um, the other research was just going back or uh, following some of these uh, roads that, characters travel or just going up and down the streets and kind of mm -hmm. seeing what I noticed with just looking around. You know. mm -hmm. So can you can you talk a little bit more about how the book came together in the structuring and, and rewriting process? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, initially, like I said, I mean, I came from the journals and I was like, I want to be done with this within two months because the first book took 10 years and it should not have taken that long other <laughs> than I just had to learn to write. Mm-hmm. And this one, uh, you know, I really wanted it to be done, you know, I wanted it to be done you know, quickly, but it just didn't work out that way. So especially just when I realized that I wanted to do it in third person and I just wanted to open it up to each chapter and different characters having, you know, it's mostly third. There's a second person point of view mm -hmm. in there. Uh, I think two of the characters have first person, um, but it was just what was that that part evolved over time. You know, I think I got the basic story and the time period set and then it was just figuring out zeroing in on different aspects of some of these different characters, like what was going to happen with uh, uh one of the characters who I think mean, that's in the second person, he's just kind of beginning a downward spiral into drug and alcohol addiction, for instance, or uh Ronnie's parents trying to figure that out. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so you know, it, it it shouldn't have taken this shouldn't have taken eight years, but it did. <laughs> a lot of it was just sometimes I just stopped for a while for band touring or mm -hmm. a lot going on with that, or mm -hmm. you know, I never fully left it. But I would step away for time to time. You know, mm -hmm. that gave you some sort of insight on it, or you know, how was it like keeping <laughs> track of how was it like keeping track of all these characters and you know where they're at and what they're going to do next, or you know, whatever it is that you have in store for them by the time you get to the end. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, there is the structure of it all, but then there's also, like, 
to the edits of just, I think I wrote on so many of the notes, like heightening and expanding, mm -hmm. you know, just heightening whatever was going on with the story and expanding, like, like just, uh, you know, all the things we talk about, mm -hmm. like, finishing school, uh, you know, um, slowing down, creating the world. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, another fun thing that you did in this was that you, you used uh, some footnotes and you even have some appendices there in the back of the book. You know, you, there's a one, oh, yeah. I think the one that stands out to me is, I, I believe it was Ronnie, maybe it was one of the other characters talking about a, a poem he wrote for some girl and, you know, you gave it a sort of note to it, you know, to look back at the appendix, uh, the, uh, the, uh, back in the appendices and you've got the, then you've got the whole poem there for those of us who want to uh, read it, which is all of us who want to read it and see what that's like. Um, how, how did that sort of thing come about? You know, I mean, you, you, when, with you giving these things, you know, full full service, but in the back of the book, how did you decide to do those sorts of things? Uh, I think part of it was just uh, creative mischief on one level, but on another <laughs> level it was like, this might help bring these char characters to life. I think there's some, like the poem about the ocean and the short story zombie mark mm -hmm. were just like yeah, yeah, that kind one. of done for, for the fun of it, really. Mm -hmm. uh, the very last appendix is of uh, a mixtape from one of the characters, Portland Patty. Mm -hmm. And that choice to have that as the very last page was deliberate. Like a lot of the songs are firmly rooted in that time period. It was just like a saying goodbye to that time period mm -hmm. for me, that time and place. Cause I, I, the next book won't be set in Florida, it won't be in the 90s at all. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you, what is what is it that you're working on right now? Uh, well, a lot of things. I got uh, got a children's story ready to go, and a, uh, oh, I would love to read that. <laughs> uh, I'm writing now, but mainly just writing a bunch of tour stories mm -hmm. that are more or less true. Um, in the last ten years of touring in bands, and now doing book tours, and mm -hmm. the uh, I don't know comedy and tragedy of it all, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so how does uh, how does being a creative writing teacher help you with your writing, Brian? Uh, it helps. It's uh, I think it's working with so many of these students, I think it's just inspiring to see how much they get done. I think uh, this generation gets a really bad rap for being entitled and spoiled mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And it's like the fact of the matter is a lot of these kids are working two, three jobs, and then going to school. Mm -hmm. And they came out of not the best family situations a lot of times. And they actually work very hard, and they care about what they're doing. And they're really trying to make the most out of their material, and that's always inspiring. Mm -hmm. I know, because as and, a, uh, Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, that's it, that's it, yeah. I'll say, because as, as, as a program, we place a pretty high demand on them having them turn in 60 pages a semester, you know, and sometimes if the, sometimes, you know, when the process isn't there, it isn't there, but, you know, the students almost always, you know, rise to that. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's, uh, they, they get it. I, most of them do. I mean, mm -hmm. the ones that stick around, you know, but it's, you know, I always find a lot to be inspired by. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know I do as well. I, I do as well. So, uh, well, the book is hilarious, Brian, and, Another Thank thing, you. another thing that I really like about it is, uh, again, some of the some of the structural things you do, like some of the sentences that go on for about you know half a page, or that just seem to meander, but they totally don't, you know, and they're just so much fun to read. And I think one of I know there's there, there's there's one phrase that you had that'll stick with me, and I'm going to steal it if you don't mind. But you described one of the characters as having a relief pitcher mustache, and 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 just <laughs> that image that just conjures up, you know, just like the perfect thing even if we don't know baseball <laughs> we know what a relief pitcher mustache looks like <laughs> that was hilarious thanks thank you so uh, do you have any websites anything else that you want to promote brian you know uh i'm going to talk about this i got a they're calling it an artist residency at the hideout in chicago next month every tuesday uh i'm going to do the first one is going to be a reading with i'm going to be reading from the book but also doing like comedy performance and doing uh, drum covers of a couple popular songs without vocals or anything, just drums. Uh, it'd be pretty silly. And then the second one's going to be Shane Neptune, 
the third one, the third Tuesday in February, I'm bringing back the talk show you mentioned earlier. Oh, cool. Just for that night. And then the fourth one, I'm playing a bunch of cover songs with friends, like uh, uh, a lot of talented musician friends, mostly from Chicago, but uh, people coming out from Seattle and Oakland as well. I'm very, very excited about all that. That's going to be 9 o'clock every Tuesday at the Hideout, Chicago. Excellent, excellent. Well, Brian, thank you very much for being on the show. Like I said, the book was great. Everyone should read Thanks this, for... Losing in Gainesville. Brian Costello, safe travels back to Kenosha. We'll see you in a few weeks when the semester starts up again. Okay, sounds good. See you then. Yeah, take care, Thanks, Brian. Chris. Yep, bye-bye. Right, bye. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words. All right, and then our first open mic reader today is going to be Walter Gascoigne. Hello, Walter. Hello, Chris. Walter, what do you have for us today? Uh, poetry, so uh, try not to laugh. Uh, here we go. It's uh, titled Life's Marathon. I run through the world at light speed, tripping over the laces of my making, seeing everything but feeling nothing. Naked I was flung out to start the race with no cannon fire or smoke, only blinding light and burning curiosity to greet my pale and shivering form. The race had begun. I crawled the first leg of the marathon. My knees were Michelins that burned rubber over the carpet, leaving skid marks showing where I had been. With my arms I steered toward uncertainty. The piston in my chest drove me forward, pausing for fuel when the tank was empty, a pit stop to pump from an unleaded titty. Never slowing down, picking up speed as my chassis grew longer. My feet became firestones that scorched the earth as I swept by in a world of flashes and shadows until the signpost could no longer be seen from my rearview mirror, careening past other racers who were nothing but a blur. Some kept pace, occasionally grinding me into the wall, colliding with my sensibility, drafting ahead by hanging on to coattails, while others spun out and fell behind, leaving pieces of themselves on the track for others to hurtle over. Faster and faster I ran, trying desperately to reach the front of the pack, gears grinding and engine redlining, my feet never touched the ground, Mercury burning in my blood, wings on my feet, accelerating at breakneck speed until I realized I had been on this track before. The oval continued on until eternity. I was going in circles, seeing everything but feeling nothing, traveling at the speed of light, tripping over the laces of my own making. All right, Walter Gascoigne, thank you very much. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words, and next up is Irene Baylock. Hello, Irene. Hello, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too, Irene. Irene, what do you have for us today? Today I have a story of a lady called Roxolana, or as I call her, Foxy Roxy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Irene Baylock, take it away. The comely and wise Roxolana, Empress of the East. It was a beautiful moonlit night, the stars twinkling in the dark sky. The townspeople were asleep and dreaming their dreams. Roxolana could not sleep. She tossed and turned. She had spent the evening singing traditional songs and getting prepared with her bridesmaids, as, she wa as was the custom, for her wedding the next day. She was to wed the handsome boy she loved and who loved her. His name was Yuri. Roxolana had known him since they were children. She was now sixteen and ready to marry. Yuri was eighteen and the lord of a large manor which his parents bequeathed to him. The bride's dowry was very adequate with ducats of gold, a chest of fine clothing, and bedding and several heads of cattle. Her parents had blessed her and were as pleased as, as uh, her parents about, excuse me, had blessed her and were as pleased about the match as Yuri's parents. This was about the year 1500, when the Ottoman Empire reached from the Baltics through Asia Minor and was the most powerful empire in the world at the time. Roxolana lived in Rohatan, Ukraine, in the Kingdom of Poland. Raids by Turks and Tatars were made into Slavic lands looking for beautiful blonde girls for the dark-haired powerful men in the harem of Turkey. A noise startled Roxolana, not only noise, but strong hands which held her down. Another man stuffed a rag in her mouth and draped a sack around her head. 
Do not squeal, little girl. Do not scream. You are in good hands. You will soon be aboard ship bound for Turkey. She could only struggle, but it was no use. The two strong men flung her across a horse and soon were galloping with her toward the wagon, which would take her down to the Dnieper River, the Black Sea, and a port bound for Constantinople, or Istanbul, as it was now known. There he was, standing in front of her, the Sultan, Suleiman Sultan the Magnificent, ruler of the Ottoman Empire. Roxolana stood straight and as tall as she could muster. She would not show that she was afraid. Inside, she was trembling with fear and foreboding. The servant girls had bathed her in perfumed water, oiled her with precious oils, plaited her long, blonde, curly hair, and dressed her in fine, colorful silks. But she would not kowtow to anyone. She was a proud child of her parents, betrothed, and knew what freedom was. Ah, you are very beautiful. I'm happy to meet you. Welcome to my harem. Let me embrace you. Welcome to my palace, stated the beaming sultan, trying to get close to Roxolana. Oh, oh, not so fast. I'm a free woman and betrothed. Your people captured me against my will and brought me here. I'm a Christian and do not believe in slavery. Your Koran does not allow rape of innocent women. Why are you forcing yourself on me? replied the beleaguered Roxolana. You know the Koran? How so? inquired Sultan the Magnificent. I was taught all historical and interesting things. As I said, I'm a free woman, not a slave, and refuse to be one. Hmm, we shall see, we shall see, my coquette. The Sultan proceeded to woo the young girl, giving her the best of everything in Topkapi Palace. She was treating, treated exceedingly well, so that the other girls in the harem began to be jealous of her. Tutors were sent to her rooms to challenge her mind, further with scholarly works, as well as those of Islam. More importantly, one of, her first, one of the first wives of Sultan, Madi Hevran, whose son was to inherit the throne, hated Roxolana so intensely that she beat her up. For this, Madi Hevran was banished and her son was later killed. In the evenings, the Sultan asked for Roxolana, had musicians play for her, and provided the best entertainment to amuse her. At first she was sad and kept silent, even crying at times. Her family and Yuri were constantly in her thoughts. She spent many a day in her room by herself. Time passed and she discovered that the Sultan was a very kind and benevolent leader of his people. She started to study about his governance, his many lands and his subjects. Soon she was giving him advice about the army, the ruling class, and the laws of the land. Sultan began not only to admire Roxolana for her beauty, but also for her mind and her shrewdness. She was also very musical, sang, and was very joyful. He gave her the name Hurem, the cheerful one, and with time, Roxolana grew to love her suitor. She adopted the religion of Islam. She bore him five sons and a daughter. Roxolana, you are wise and beautiful. I have written poems for you. Of course, Sultan the Magnificent recited these verses to his beloved Roxolana. The Sultana of the Ottoman Empire became successful in ruling it along with her husband. She oversaw the acquisition of many lands and the building of magnificent structures. Because she cared for the poor, she also was involved in several charitable causes for women and orphans, especially in Mecca, in Medina, and also in Istanbul. Roxolana wrote to the King of Poland for a let-up in the slavery of Polish and Ukrainian girls, because as you see, this was Rohat in Ukraine, but in the Kingdom of Poland. 
Bearing five sons and a daughter, there was, of course, intrigued in the palace. Who would succeed to the throne? One of her sons, or a son from a previous wife, or perhaps a son-in-law, the husband of one of her daughters. If one of her children did not succeed to the throne, they may, might all be murdered. Surely Roxolana played her cards with members of the family so that she won, and her daughter's husband became the rightful heir. She even won over her mother-in-law, and that was quite a trick. She also had her rival, Madi Hevran, banished from the palace. When she persuaded the sultan to have her freedom and no longer be his concubine, he had to marry her. Otherwise, she said, it was a sin to live the way she did. Such was the power of the beloved Sultana Roxolana Khurem. A beautiful sarcophagus was built to hold her remains in Constantinople, Istanbul, close to Sult Sultan the Magnificent. Novels have been written about her in Ukrainian, Polish, Spanish, and of course Turkish. The novel in Ukrainian was required reading in high school when my husband went to school. Painters painted her portrait, plays, ballets, and films have been made about her in many languages. Joseph Haydn's Symphony No. 63 is dedicated to Roxolana's beauty and memory, as well as the opera by Denis Sichinsky. Her statue can be found in Rohatin, Ukraine, her hometown, as, we as well as in Mariupol, Crimea. I had the privilege to travel to Constantinople, Istanbul, tour the beautiful city, view Topkapi Palace with its harem, and view Roxolana's gorgeous tomb. Irene Balak, thank you very much. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words, and next up is Mary McDonald. Hello, Mary. Hello. Mary, what do you have for us today? I have Chapter 13 of my first novel, uh, No Good Deed. All right, and take it away. Uh, Mark's eyes rolled back. Jim tore at the plastic, his fingers slipping against the wet film. Damn it, someone help me before he dies. He hoped it wasn't, he wasn't too late. Damn traffic. The guard stooped, one looked working on the wrap while the other released the shackles. When they rolled Taylor onto his side, water, water poured from his nose. Jim pounded on the unconscious man's back and was rewarded with a weak cough, then a stronger one as more water drained. Relief swept through Jim as he knelt on one knee. Taylor gagged and choked, then his eyes fluttered open. Thank God. Jim stood, fury rising in him, replacing the relief. Turning towards Bill, he ground out, What the hell were you doing? Bill glared back. I was interrogating the subject. What does it look like? Ignoring him for the moment, Jim addressed the guards and pointed to Taylor, still lying dazed and gasping on the floor. Take him to the infirmary and have him checked out. Jim faced the interested expressions of the others in the room and strode to the table. How the hell could these guys just sit here and watch? None had bothered to help make sure Taylor didn't die. It took every shred of his self-control to speak in a calm voice. If you would all excuse us, I need to confer with Bill. I'll let each of you know what is going on as soon as possible. Dr. Weiss, the medical expert on the team, looked like he was going to argue, but Jim gave him a hard look. You have an objection, Jack, doctor? He, of all people, had the duty to make sure no lasting harm would be done, and yet here he sat, looking befuddled. The other man stood and shook his head as he gathered up his papers. No, but I wanted to let you know about the unusual circumstances before the interrogation began. Jim leaned on the table with both hands. What kind of circumstances? The subject insisted that he knew what was going to happen, and he asked to write it down and put it in a sealed envelope. Dr. Wise pointed to the corner where Mark was now standing on trembling legs. The guard shackled him, and Jim had to bite his tongue to keep from telling them not to do so. Protocol had to be followed. Mark had recovered enough to send a hate-filled glare in Jim's direction. The envelope hasn't been touched since Bill taped it there. I'm curious, and I'm sure the team is as well. The other two members hesitated at the doorway. At a tearing sound, Jim looked over his shoulder to see Bill yank the em an envelope off the wall. Jim straightened and held out his hand. I'll take that. Bill's mouth set in a thin line, but he gave Jim the envelope. As a senior member, Jim had the authority. He knew it rankled Bill at times, but this was the first time he had seen outright anger. He decided to spare Bill any further embarrassment and nodded to Dr. Weiss. Thank you for telling me about this. I'll let you know if it's pertinent to the investigation. He waved a dismissal to the others. 
Jim would have liked to open it with Taylor present, but that would mean the guards would be privy to the contents as well, only he had a feeling that this information should be kept secret. He nodded towards Mark. I hope you'll feel better soon. It was the closest he could come to an apology. The anger in Mark's eyes wavered, then his shoulders slumped. The guards led him away. Well, aren't you going to open it? Bill sprawled into a chair, pointing with his chin at the envelope in Jim's hands. The guy was a real pistol tonight. Told me to just get it over with. Get what over with? What were we going to do? Claimed he dreamed it last night. Bill clasped his hands behind his head and grinned. The hairs on the back of Jim, Jim's neck rose, and he paused as he tore the seal. He said that? Yeah, but he wanted to write, write it down instead of telling us. I s decided to go along with it. Thought maybe he would write something useful while he was at it. Hmm, well, let's see. Jim unfolded the paper and smoothed it on top of the table. The handwriting scrawled across the page, but it was still clear enough to read without any problem. Taylor had outlined in stark detail exactly what was going to happen. Jim read it and slid it over to Bill. I wasn't here for most of this, so I don't know if he's right or not. What do you think? Bill lowered his hands with a sigh and slouched forward to read the paper. Seconds later, his back straightened and his eyebrows rose. He flipped the paper, his eyes racing across the lines of print. When he finished, he looked up at Jim. Well, holy hell, what do you know? He has it verbatim, right down to a remark I made. Jim pulled out a chair and flopped onto it. So what do we do about it? What do you mean? Bill sounded puzzled. It's interesting, but doesn't change anything. Jim narrowed his eyes and leaned forward. How can you say that? Either what he's been telling us all along is true, or someone on this team set it this up. Bill shrugged. Who the hell would set this up? He stood and pointed a finger at Jim. Are you accusing me of arranging this, this scam? Leaning one arm on the table, he swept the other in a vague motion towards Taylor's cell block. Maybe the guy got lucky. He's had enough sessions in here that he could have guessed. But if this is his attempt to get released, it's not going to work. Jim felt his jaw tighten and exerted every measure of his self-control to keep his anger in check. His instinct was to jump up and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the guy. Instead, he tilted the chair back on two legs, put his feet on the table, and crossed his arms, giving Bill a hard stare until the other man sat down. As if the outburst hadn't occurred, he said in a calm voice, Of course I don't think you set it up, but there were others in the room. We'll need to keep alert for troublemakers. He let his feet drop to the floor and stood. However, this fight fiasco notwithstanding, I do have doubts about Taylor's guilt. Unless you uncovered anything with this session today. Bill shook his head. Nope, just more of the same denials. Either Taylor is the world's toughest guy or he's not connected to any terrorists. The implication that Taylor was innocent and had been caught up in a post-9-11 witch hunt wasn't something that he wanted to think about. There were too many people involved. Something like that wouldn't happen. The designation of enemy combatant needed approval from the highest authorities. It wasn't Jim's job to question it. It doesn't matter anyway. We can't just let him go. Who knows? Maybe the guy's tough. Maybe he's just stupid or a martyr. Bill stood and waved his hand. Besides, there's still the confession by his friend and his trip to Afghanistan to consider. That's all BS, and you know it. His friend named half of his address book. From what I read, that guy was a bit player, a wannabe terrorist. His confessions have yielded a big fat zero as far as actionable intelligence. In fact, the last memo stated he's already been released back to his home country. Bill shot Jim a look of surprise. Oh, I missed that one, I guess. He sank, sank back onto his chair and drummed his fingers on the table. Jim nodded. I'll find it and forward it to you. But Taylor was still in Afghanistan. So, lots of journalists and photographers were in the country in the last several years. Should we go round them all up? Why was he defending the guy? Jim shook off the thought. He wasn't defending. He was simply playing the devil's advocate. Bill sighed and rubbed circles on his temples. What other evidence do we have? The calls? Is that it? Exactly. The evidence we do have, the calls, warning of the attacks. Jim began ticking off the list on his fingers. His association with someone who has contacts within Al-Qaeda and his trip to Afghanistan hasn't been built upon since his detainment began. We're still at square one. You think he's innocent. It was a statement. Jim flipped the envelope against one hand, tapping it as he paced in front of the table. Innocent? It was hard to contemplate. Difficult, difficult to accept. I don't know, I'm, but I'm not comfortable with what we have so far. If we don't get more soon, we're going to have to, take, have to make some serious decisions. Shaking his head, Bill said, Even if the guy is innocent, how could we let him go? You know he'd go running off and telling the press. That's a possibility, but not a reason to keep him prisoner. It shouldn't even be a factor in our decision. We're not some communist country who locks up dissidents. If he wants to speak, it's his right. Well, shoot. 
Bill propped his elbows on the table, his hands on either side of his head. After a moment, he dropped his hands. What about the non a non-disclosure contract? You mean an agreement to keep quiet? The idea put a sour taste in Jim's mouth. You have a better idea? Bill spread his hands. Look, Jim, I'm not so sure this guy is innocent. However, like you said, we haven't been able to get any hard evidence. I concede that. None of the teams have, so we're not alone. Jim halted his pacing, tucked the envelope inside his breast pocket, and tugged down the lapels. I think we dig in deeper. Try some new techniques. If those don't work, then I don't think we have any choice but to recommend release. All right, Mary McDonald, thank you very much. The book is No Good Deed, and it's available on... Uh, Amazon. It's available on Amazon, Apple, Kobo, Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you read us an excerpt from somewhere in the middle of the book. It's got a military aspect, too, but there's also this sort of fantastical component, too, involving a camera, right? Right. It's it's uh, Mark can see the future. So he had seen uh, the events of 9-11 <clears throat> before it happened, and so he was trying to warn the authorities, and that brought him to the attention and got him in prison as a, a suspected terrorist. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Mary McDonald, thank you very much. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words, and next up is going to be Jeff Sturge. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Chris. How are you? Good, good. Jeff, what do you have for us today? Uh, I am going to read three poems from a collection of poetry that I'm putting together. Um, the book is called You're Not an Angel, and I will start with one that is titled Sundress Kryptonite. Something in my mind keeps on moving. This compass of mine just keeps spinning, spinning around in carousel sounds. It's in this mirror that, a, that objects start getting clearer. It's when the wind just dances with her and her dress. Her dress just ruffles. Such a cool, cool, perfect mess. She's my inner muse, my inner electric fuse. Her shoulders, soft and so bare. I rush the hour, yet I stop. Stand and stare. I just stare. Wow. A heart that's clear and blue. All for you. Her makeup, made up of elements, dancing in circles, is how her heart goes. Goes on to the moon. She has only one choice, and that is to follow. Hopefully she'll take me along. In case I don't get the chance to say, your sundress is my kryptonite, this riddle within this day. Half in the middle, I confess, I call to the sun for some blindness. Handmade soul on the edges of beautiful music. In these pools that I wade inside this, just for her. I know, an infatuation I have, I have to confess. It's hard to hide tonight this weakness, now unveiled. Forward, I must prevail. Yet, you are my sundress kryptonite in this revolving heart, this compass of mine. The second one is called A Man Without a Cape. Maybe I'm punch drunk. Maybe I'm headstrong. Maybe I was meant to be loved more than once in a lifetime. Maybe I had vision. Maybe I was never good at math, you know, division. Maybe I was never meant to make you happy. Can't you see, here I am. I can't seem to fly still, though I try. What the hell? Maybe there's a different chapter, no verse, no good end. Maybe I skipped the preface or the author's notes, who knows? I'm just a man, a man without a cape. I'm betting you really didn't know that. You killed me somewhat when you said, you said that I'm not your angel, that I must be your ghost. Then, appearing out of nowhere, like a forgotten dream, a forgotten color within me, but who knows? I am a living dream, and I'll tell you what I do know. I can't leap tall buildings, and I can't fly at the speed of sound. And I can't bend bars with my hands. And I can't stop a speeding train. Now, the same wind from the same man. I can catch you if you leap into my arms. 
and I can love you at the speed of profound. And I can hold you tight with my bare hands, and I can be there for you when you feel pain. Honestly, dear, I feel that I'm lightning trapped in a bottle. I'm the love in the ink of my pen. I'm destiny hitching a ride from nowhere I recognize. I'm lost wanting to be found. But you know what? I'm just a man. Just a man without a cape. And this last one is called Happiness List. I want to feel like, like she just stole a personal secret from me. Right in front of me. Sheepishly smile and then thank me for understanding the spontaneity of it all. I want her to make fun of me as we look through old photo albums from when I was an awkward child. I want her, want her to look over at me and say, say in the near future, when we're in a foreign country vacationing, she pinches me on the arm just to let me know that this is real. I want to have tickle fights, pillow fights, restless nights, laundry nights, bill nights, and candlelights. I want her to be okay if I make a better pasta sauce than her. I want her to give me flowers every once in a while. I want her to kiss me in the rain and know exactly why she did it. I want her to know that she steals the covers in the middle of the night, then realizing it and then curling up close. I want her to tag me and say, you're it, at least twice in a lifetime. I want her to straighten my tie in public if it looks a little bit crooked knowing that I did it on purpose just to get her close to me. I want her to catch me checking her out. She stops momentarily, then curls her hair around her ear and says, Stop, I must look frightful. I want her to know that I can be hopelessly simple when it comes to the matters of the heart and to the matters of a lifetime together. Oh, Jeff Sturch, thank you. Thank you very much. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words, and our next reader is going to be Jim Janice. Hello, Jim. Hi, Chris. Jim Janis, what do you have for us today? Um, I have a uh, teaser for a, a storytelling event that the Kenosha Writers Guild is partially sponsoring. It's in September, or I'm sorry, it's on uh, February 12th. At, <laughs> I don't know why I said September. So this coming February 12th at Kenosha Fusion in Kenosha. So uh, I've got a story to tell. This is a literary version of that story, and it's really just the beginning. All right, well, Jim Janice, take it away. Her uncle wanted to meet me, to size me up, she said, to see if I could handle her. Camila and I had just married. It was the second for each of us. A month later, we flew from O'Hare to Chopin Airport, Warsaw. There, summer is as hot as here, and sweat soaked through Uncle Yannick's dress shirt, which opened at the neck. He lifted our last suitcase into the trunk of his dusty Renault, and we were on our way. As he drove us away from the airport, Camila explained that Mazurski, the region of Poland where we would stay, is known for its 2,000 lakes. In a few hours, we pulled up to the hotel. New looking, a red corrugated roof over rows of windows set into white stucco. After we checked in, we walked outside with Uncle Yannick to the pier on a calm lake. He spoke to the young man at the rowboats. Camila told me he asked how much per hour. The man and Camila looked at each other with familiarity. On our drive to her cousin's farm, I sat alone in the back seat, looking at the vast fields of wheat, the forests of tall pines, and the lakes all as I pictured them as a boy when I read The Teutonic Nights. Now I was in Eastern Europe, and I listened to Yannick and Camila speak the language. Before the trip, I studied. Each weekday, driving to and from the office, I listened to the CD of vocabulary. Now I listened to Camila and her uncle. He sounded upset. I heard him say the Polish words for boats, high school, and boyfriend. In an hour, we pulled onto the farm. I met Camila's aunt and Camila's two grown cousins. Adam and Etik came out, shirtless, each with a red face and a big smile, 
each holding a tall beer can in one hand and a fishing rod in the other. Their eyes shined as they walked to a tiny red car. That's the Fiat, Camila said to me. They're taking you fishing. I'll drive. My second ride in Poland, again in the back seat, but this time squished between Yannick's sons. Up front, he spoke directions to Camila. She pulled onto the two-lane highway and headed the direction of the hotel. But ten minutes into the ride, Yannick gave another instruction. Camila made a hairpin turn to the right, leaving the two-lane highway for a sort of frontage road. We continued along a curve that carried us away from the highway and into a field. Camila slowed the car as the pavement turned to gravel, and eventually the gravel turned to two tire tracks with grass growing between. We could hear and feel the grass brushing the undercarriage, and outside the tall grass grew above window level. When we could see no more, I heard Yannick command Camila to stop. She put the car in park and looked over her shoulder at me. You're getting out here. I got out with Yannick and the cousins. She said, I'll be back in an hour or so. And the roof of the little red car disappeared into the tall grass. There I stood in the Eastern European countryside, ready to fish, but there was no lake. All I saw was the great field of tall grass and a nearby line of tall trees. At that moment, I remembered a 1971 film called Straw Dogs, in which Dustin Hoffman played a mathematician who moves with his bride from the U.S. to her hometown in rural England. And I remembered the scene where a few guys from the village take the mathematician into a remote field on a snipe hunt while his bride's old boyfriend stays behind to meet up with her. Yannick's call interrupted my memory, and I followed the in-laws through the line of tall trees. On the other side, it looked exactly the same, another great field of tall grass, except here stood a large piece of construction equipment, a backhoe, yellow with black tires, and next to it was a perfectly rectangular pond, dug out of what must have been a peat bog. Now it was a pond of stagnant black water. This is where Yannick, Adam, and Etik took me to fish. In the land of 2,000 lakes, they took me to this tiny made-up one. All right, Jim Janis, thank you very much. All right, our final piece today is by Richard Bell, regular contributor Richard Bell, who cannot be here today, so I will read his story for him. This is called Frosty the Snow Demon. It was two months after Christmas and Frosty the snowman was still alive and well and sadly forgotten. Of course, he was upset that people did not remember him and sing his song anymore. After all, it was still winter and snowmen thrive in winter. Therefore, he decided to use his superpowers to bring a lot of extremely cold polar air this way to remind people that he still existed and needed attention. He started spinning fast as he could, creating a low-pressure area and drawing the cold polar air southward. Every time someone slipped on the ice, he chuckled to himself. Whenever there was a road accident due to ice, he went nuts with laughter. He really was a sick bastard. Eventually, it got to be so bad that a huge wall of ice a mile high started moving south from Canada, racing at the dizzying speed of five feet per year. Everyone was freaking out except the scientists, who claimed it wasn't happening and that we should all ignore our senses. Frosty continued causing trouble with his cold spells, and finally the government took action. They built huge bonfires next to the ice wall, but Frosty's snow blizzards put them out. Next, they sent up a giant space they sent up giant space mirrors to focus the sun on the ice. But Frosty caused huge clouds to block the rays. Then the wall was attacked by the military, but the explosives had no effect. When the government ran out of options, they sent for Valentine Jablonski, a local hero who had once accidentally sent his own pants on fire. Valentine gathered together his ice picks a carrot, 
and an extra pair of boots and set off for the evil ice wall. He ran as fast as he could, stabbing the wall with the pick and making lots of ice cubes, which people used for their vodka martinis. As Valentine was rounding a corner in North Dakota, he found Frosty and confronted him. Valentine offered him a new carrot nose, and Frosty was greedy and vain enough to accept the offer. As Frosty was getting his nose job, our hero took the boots and jammed them into Frosty's back, but it had no effect since he was only made of snow. Then he took his coffee cup and poured hot coffee onto Frosty's head, and the coffee melted into his brain. Frosty screamed and raised his arms, and a terrible wind blew. But Valentine was able to stand it because he was from Wisconsin and used to bad weather. Frosty quickly recovered and was madder than ever. That is when Valentine had his great idea, of which he gets about one per year. He started scooping and rolling snow and created a snow woman with two enormous snowballs for breasts. Frosty stopped and stared at it and knew he was in love. Now that he had a real girlfriend, he no longer felt the need to punish people, and the snow people migrated north and lived happily ever after, and the glacier melted. Valentine went home to watch TV, as he does at the end of all of these stories about him. The end. <laughs> Richard Bell, thank you very much. You are listening to Speaking of Our Words. All right, and next up then we have Lisa adamowitz Kless from the Kenosha Writers Guild. So, Lisa, if someone wants to join the Kenosha Writers Guild, what do they need to do? Well, uh, we're a free group, so I would just welcome people to come on down to a meeting and see what we're all about. We meet every third Thursday of the month um, for our main meeting. And uh, every second Thursday, we offer workshops, um, guest speakers, panel discussions, in-depth critique sessions. So, um, yeah, all of them are free and open to the public. And where are the meetings held these days? We are at the Hedberg Library, um, or in the Hedberg Library at Carthage College in Kenosha. All right, very good. Lisa Adams kless thank you very much. That's our show for the day. Thank you all very much to all of our guests. Uh, Brian Costello, uh, Walter Gascoigne, Irene Baylock, Mary McDonald, Jeff Sturch, Jim Janis, Richard Bell, and Lisa Adamowitz kless If you have any questions or comments or wish to participate on this program, please visit KenoshaWritersGuild.com and come to one of our meetings. Meetings. Feel free to visit the Facebook page uh, for the group and for this show. Speaking of our words, please feel free to leave a comment on our Facebook page and on the YouTube page as well if you're listening to this. Thank you very much to Dave Cole and WGTD, Steve Brown and Nita Hunter, Troy McDonald, Lisa Adamowitz Kless, and the Kenosha Writers Guild. Thank you for listening. This is Christy Guire and the world needs your stories. We will see you again soon. Thank you.